This podcast could potentially have adult language, adult themes, definitely drinking, and possibly the possibility of sexual content. <clears throat> Listener discretion is advised. Hello, Drinking With Authors fans. We have some pretty big news from your host here, Erica Lance. We are moving to change the format of the show to be one episode. So there's a few episodes that were recorded the old way that we're doing the new way. And that's what you're listening to. So thank you. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And we love having you as fans. On to the show. Welcome to Drinking With Authors. I'm your host, Erica Lance. My co-host today is the probably going to interrupt 50 times Val Willis. And our guest today is Libby McNamee. Welcome. Welcome. (laughs) Thank you. Huzzah. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Okay. So let's first talk about what we're drinking so people can drink along as long as they're not driving because we're not (laughs) condoning that. Okay. So I made a screwdriver. It's in an orange cup too, which is really cool, but it's orange juice and, and some Tito's because I was racing around getting ready for a trip. So that's it's boring, but yet effective. Val, what are you going to tempt fate with I found, today? I found this bottle called Sweet Bitch Mango Moscato. Ah. I'm drinking it on my mason jar. I only poured two cups worth of wine. I'm I'm gonna be okay. That's Famous awesome. last words out of Val. Famous <laughs> last words. I, I, it's the only time I drink. So this, yeah, yeah, <laughs> likely story. Yeah, <laughs> it's actually unfortunately true. So these podcasts get really interesting when she tries new things like that. And she's oh, not Chipping, sure what her- Chipping put me under the table. I don't think I remember the last half of that podcast. So oh, hilarious. It is very funny. You should listen to it. Anyway, Libby, what are you drinking? I have this lovely little concoction here, which is quite simple. It's in an, oh, this is an antique champagne glass that belonged to my mother-in-law. But this is, um, I live in Richmond, Virginia. And- there's a company called Bell Isle, and um, it was this, the scene of a, it was a uh, prisoner of war camp during the Civil War, Bell Isle. But now they brew um, this amazing uh, moonshine, and they have all kinds of different flavors. And this is my favorite, which is the Kuzu Ginger. Ooh, that sounds amazing, actually. Oh, my gosh. It's, they have, like, lavender. They have coffee. They, they have the habanero, which is really good. What else? Oh, wow. oh, blood orange. That's another really good one. And and where is this at? Richmond, Virginia. Oh, well, next time I'm in Richmond, I know where I'm going because that's exactly. Yeah, I'll have to check that out because I'm a big fan of moonshine, a big fan of ginger, and a big fan of habanero. Okay. So woo! I'll send you the link. All the right things for Erica. She is going to be there. Yeah, send me the link because <laughs> I'll be like, and I got all of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a business trip. Yeah, exactly. Uh, trust me, I could make it a business trip in 2.5 seconds. Okay, so um, for the audience out there that may not know you, what do you write? I write historical fiction about um, American women who have made a big difference in history, who I think haven't gotten their their due. So um, I write it for a kind of like a middle grade audience. So basically fifth grade through seventh grade right in there and but it, as it's turned out with the pandemic and all that half my readers are adults um so i've got two books um i've got uh my first was um is uh Susanna's midnight ride the girl who won the revolutionary war so it's based on the true story of a girl from virginia who saved general lafayette from capture leading the way for the battle of yorktown um oh, wow. so it's a little a little known true story that i stumbled on and um and uh, you know, as the rest they say is history. And um, and then I my second book is Dolly Madison in the War of 1812. And now I'm working on a um story about a woman named Elizabeth Van Lu, who was a Union spy in Richmond during the Civil War, who was just absolutely amazing and um yeah, incredible. So I'm I'm now I'm fighting the Civil War, my third oh, year. I, I love all first of all, I love that you're writing middle grade historical fiction. I don't know that I've ever heard anybody say I'm writing middle grade historical fiction. Like that's awesome, but it's the right thing to tell some of these stories that are not included in the history books, especially in a time now when the history books may or may not be the true history of the United States because exactly uh, fun things happening in the the world of books. Interesting. Yes. What made you start doing this? 
It's funny. It's a it's it's a long story, but it's it's amazing. When I first moved to Richmond, I didn't know anyone. And I rented this apartment and I the first day when I was going to move in, I couldn't unlock the front door and a little two-year-old girl let me in. And she and her parents became my best friends and only friends at the beginning. And um, so I always said I was like Kramer. I was like always dropping by their apartment. I lived upstairs. And, you know, a few years later, I ended up getting married and she was a flower girl in our wedding. And um, she actually died. This amazing girl. She died when she was 14. She had one of those irregular. um, She had like a uh, what do you call that? It was a congenital heart defect. So you know, nothing genetic, but just one of those things that happens and they didn't know. And she was training for the track team going into high school. So I was at her, at her wake and there were just like spirals of people around. And I met her uncle who I'd never met. And we were talking about how this girl, Joy, aptly named, always, you know, was amazing at bringing people together. So um, he said, oh, I heard you're a writer and I've got this story for you. You really need to write it. And he was married to a descendant of hers. So oh. that's how I ended up hearing the story. And it's funny because I'm from Boston. So I grew up hearing all about Paul Revere. And um, so I was like, you mean there was a whole like Southern part of the revolution? Like, really? And um, so I started researching it really to kind of prove that it wasn't true. Because I thought, why is this girl not in the history books? There's no way this could have happened. And then I actually found a couple of sources that cited her. And then it was really exciting because I felt like, I had stumbled onto this. Yeah, 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 it was, exactly. And um, and it reminded me a lot of the uh, what the the, um, story about the women um, who developed all the uh, did all the research for NASA but got none of the credit. And I'm blanking the hidden figures. Yes, yes. So it's kind of like discovering one of the hidden figures. And um, so then I just started researching, and I really actually fell in love with the history. And so that's part of the reason I really like writing for middle grade is because I was really never interested in history until my 40s. And I know it's hard to believe I'm over 21, but it's true. Um, but <laughs> I uh, but I now I it's like I love to kind of get kids excited about history and have them realize that it's stories about people, quirky people. And once you you know, it's not just dates and places and things to memorize it. It's stories that are very entertaining. So it's, it's, it's really, as Bob Ross would say, it's been kind of a happy accident. It's like, I wrote the book that I wanted to write, but I didn't really know what I was doing. And it's been really transferable. So I do like school author visits, but I also go to retirement homes and I talk to historical societies and I do, you know, kind of a little bit of everything. And, um, and it's fun to, I've got my book in all, both books in a lot of historical museums like Mount Vernon and Colonial Williamsburg, where I beat. Mean, I never would have dreamed that that would ever be a possibility. So um, I'm really, I just consider myself really fortunate how it kind of all transpired. But um, definitely was a big, big component. Like I I tell people all the time. And of course, Erica gives me crap all the time because she's like, how the hell do you know this? Like this is such an obscure fact about history or mythology or something. But there's so many untold stories that are stuck in the rug. And I I clearly remember my worst subject in high school was history because I fought with the teacher. I said, this is inaccurate. This is not what happened. And he says, can't you just take the test and answer what the book says? I said, no, because I'm not going to waste my time to learn the in correct version of yep. what went down and there was like any and then I showed him proof of where it was incorrect and he's like can't you just like Suck why can't up? you just, and I'm like no yeah. no that defeats the whole idea of what history is about so like your books are the kind of books I used to be like starving for in high school oh uh, yeah I think my first flavor was a book called A Time for Angels by Karen Hess oh, and that's when I okay yeah, and it's Write a that down. yes, <laughs> and it's about a, a girl during the beginning of World War One. the The flu is hit. She catches it. Her mom has already died from it, or dad, and she ends up on a train fever induced, and then finds and she's a Jewish girl, and she finds herself in the care of a clearly German man, and there's all this controversy and things in there, and it teaches this wonderful like we're just human and we're all trying to survive kind of aspect but mm-hmm. like no one seemed to 
in school though when we got to that lesson not once did they mention that there was a flu and I'm like yeah yeah lost more soldiers to the flu than we did in the war like I think right. that's mentioning so that i love this so much oh thank you yeah and i'm excited to hear that you're doing civil war because there were so many women involved oh. on both sides in yeah civil- yes and it's like the first time that women got in the workforce like literally mm-hmm. people were angry that women were becoming nurses because it wasn't considered ladylike what if you see a man's genitals or something and <laughs> then they were like okay we're desperate cool you know but like women weren't even allowed to be teachers and I mean, there were, you know, it, it just, the Civil War just changed our society in so many different ways. I mean, it was, it was the first time that they started making clothes like small, medium, and large. Like before that, everything was tailored, but they just had to start doing things that way. But yeah, it's it's fascinating. And it's funny because each, each war that I've fought now at the beginning, I'm like, oh, this woman sounds fascinating, but this war is going to be so boring. And then I'm like, I- like now you can't shut me up about, you know, any of the three wars and, um, you know, cause the little factoids, like, like here's one of my favorite factoids. Cause it's as with writers, you know, they always say, you know, you want to show, not tell and say, Oh, you know, things were awful in Richmond, you know, during the war, there wasn't enough food. It's like, okay, it got to the point where the only thing butchers had hanging in their windows were opossums. And it's like, that's just like the perfect example of showing and not telling. Cause just like, wow, that's how bad it was. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. Just the, like the nuggets, I call them historical nuggets that are buried in there. And, um, they kind of, uh, I don't know. I just, I, I just get really excited about them as you could tell. So <laughs> I, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm like, I'm, I'm bursting at the seams. I'm like, oh, I wonder if she knows about this and this and the moon sisters. And, you know, it, it's awesome that it all transpired by that one per chance meeting. And, and, you know, I, my great grandmother had this saying, and it was, you know, life will never take you where you want to go. It always takes you where you need to go. Mm-hmm. And this three found you needed to be out there and it found a way out you know, through its own, own relatives, strangely enough, which yeah. is pretty epic. Um, right. What made you decide to t- tell Dolly Madison's story next? Like, cause there was, well, so well, that's a good question. it's funny. Cause originally I thought I loved the Susanna story so much. I thought I'm never going to find another story I love as much. And a friend of mine, my best friend, um, invited me to go to a lecture on Dolly Madison and it was her birthday. And I was thinking, I don't want to go Dolly Madison, like hostess with the mostest, like war of 1812. And I'm like, it's her birthday. And I'm like, sure, let's go. And it was the CEO of Montpelier. And by the time before it was even over, I was like, this is my next book. But I found out like Dolly Madison had like a Tunisian saber hidden under her bed while the British were marching towards Washington city, just in case they got by the hundred guards out front and um, just learning more about her. It's like her hostess with the mostest and she was, but that was the tip of the iceberg. There was so much more going on underneath. And I really just fell in love with her. And then I was like, Oh my gosh, the war of 1812 is actually like so exciting. I mean, I never thought I would utter those words all together in one sentence. And I mean, (laughs) you know, the British marching in unopposed to Washington City, like the Battle of Baltimore with people pouring in from all over the country and Francis Scott Key writing, you know, our national anthem while he's being held on a British prison ship. And then the Battle of New Orleans, and they can't even get information back from the Battle of New Orleans to even know if they won or not. And I mean, it's just incredible. But, you know, I didn't know much about it. I didn't know much about the War of 1812 at all. I mean, it ended in 1815. I mean, (laughs) it's yeah it's it's just, it really it, that's what I feel like people are kind of missing out because especially like the war of 1812 it's like it it ties yeah. together the revolutionary war and the civil war, civil war. Yep. in our classes we go you know revolutionary war to civil war and it's you know that period in the middle is it's kind of like we won the contest we won that you know we won the pizzas and what do we do with all these pizzas like we don't you know we don't Washington city was like a mud pit and it was, they called it what streets with no buildings, buildings with no streets. So when Dolly and James Madison first moved to Washington city, their address was six buildings. 
because it was the one place where there's six buildings together and it didn't yeah. have a street name. Like, and you think about DC now with like, you know, <laughs> could you imagine? 495 yeah. and yeah. So <laughs> it's like that kind of stuff of like. One with oh the, the museum in the center and. <laughs> yeah. I'm, yeah. Wow. This was no. the right combo of you two. Yeah. This is, yeah. Yeah. This is just like, like I'm just watching. I'm watching. I'm just, she's just watching now. two, two historical two geeks. advocates just rah. No. And just like you said, like everyone assumes that he wrote the national anthem during the revolutionary war. And he did right. it was during the, the war of 1812. And yes. that's like one of those things, the history books, like just, I remember arguing with the teacher, like he didn't write this during the Revolutionary War. Right, he wasn't like, alive. I mean, you're right a little boy. Yeah, and yeah. he actually was a distant cousin of Dolly Madison's. And what was interesting about Francis Scott Key is that he was totally against the war. He was a Federalist. He called it, um, what do you call it, a lump of wickedness? And um, I mean, he was just like, you know, so absolutely against it. And then once Washington City was burned, then basically everyone had a common enemy and people, everyone was for the war. And, you know, all of a sudden that he didn't, you know, he wasn't a Federalist anymore. He was an American. So it was kind of, like, you know, amazing that he wrote this song and he was so against the war to begin with. But the outrage of having our capital city burned just yeah. brought everyone together and people poured in from like every state in the union, you know, and worked around the clock, like little kids, old ladies, and, you know, repelled the greatest military in the world. And it, yeah, but I'm like, nobody really knows. Nobody really knows that we almost lost our country. Yeah. I mean, I had no idea. And it, the, uh, the hilarious thing about it is the British, they don't even have a name for it. They just call it the American conflict because it was so low on their radar. It doesn't even deserve a name. And yeah. to us, you know, but then again, you know, like I said, it's like started in 1812, ended in 1815, and we call it the War of 1812. So, yeah. Well, we don't have to remember all of history, obviously, because right. we want to just keep repeating it. So, yes, yes. Isn't, isn't that what we do? Isn't that how it works? Yep. Terrifying. It does, but we never, we never learn the lesson. Yeah. You know, Speaking of lessons, I noticed on um because I I me me and Erica try to cyberstalk people for a hot minute as a refresher before we start. I'm honored. I I saw that you have study guides for both books. Is that right? Yep. Yep. Um, I was that I something did, yes. you went in wanting to do, or something that was sort of in development and and work with the publisher. Kind Actually, of it was kind of like one of those pandemic projects. And oh. I was just having coffee with a friend and, and she's like, why don't you make a workbook, you know, get on that. And, um, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm all up for some busy work. And, and then it was actually kind of fun to go back through it. Cause at that point I, you know, I had already the book, you know, Susanna's midnight ride had been out for a couple of years. So it was, it was kind of fun to go back and like, look for vocabulary and look for, you know, discussion questions and that kind of thing. So, and then, then I did it for the, the Dolly one as well. So, um, just a, you know, kind of a fun exercise. I know a lot of librarians and teachers that we've encountered uh, in the last few years are like, please, please put it in there. Like the idea that they have a resource like that in a book and they can, you know, help them encourage the kids. Uh, and then even parents can pick up the book with that study guide and homeschool. Like yeah. it, that that seems to be like a new staple, especially among middle grade style books of these pieces that do not just tell a historical fiction fiction or historical recalling um or cover certain aspects but take the time to say hey let's talk about the actual history that was tied in here let's talk about the actual vocab and the actual mm -hmm. science behind this and i think it's such a wonderful movement because i think think I would know what I could and couldn't take away from this story better as a kid myself who who relied on books to learn everything you know right right well it's kind of neat with that I've gotten a lot of really nice compliments from teachers about the vocabulary that I used and I'm I love words and I love playing with words I love the thesaurus so I really spent a lot of time of you know instead of using small using you know lilliputian or you know really trying to, but also trying to make sure that they were 
adjectives that would have been used in that time period because that adds to the aura of the story too of mm-hmm. using these you know, gobsmacked and, you know, all these kind of gadzooks and that kind of stuff or huzzah. And um, like kids love huzzah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's hilarious. My favorite thing to yell out at a rent fair. So I'm going to yes. throw that oh, out really? there. Oh, yeah. oh my gosh. I've got a, uh, I've got a huzzah sweatshirt. Um, yeah. I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm kind of a huzzah freak. <laughs> Well, but then it's funny with this. It was huzzah during the War of 1812, but now during the Civil War, it's hurrah. So I've got to change with the times and move on to hurrah. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, now you're gonna uh, have to get a whole new sweatshirt. I mean, exactly. Yep. Excuses to buy clothing one has never heard before. 101 what they scream out in the book so that I can do it that way. Crazy. Hey, listeners, you know me, Eric Lance. You're just listening to me in the podcast that you have. But guess what? I'm doing something new. Yeah, she's joining me, Mark Muncy, the author of the Erie, Florida book series in Erie, Appalachia. And we are hosting a new podcast called Erie Travels. Woo-woo, Erie Travels, which covers things like ghosts, cryptids, weird stuff, UFOs, men in black, all kinds of fun things that people talk about. And I'm sure you've discussed with friends. Yep. And you can listen to us on your favorite podcast platform of choice or find us at eerietravels.com and join in the fun and all the spooky goodness. And of course, Mark, what do we always say? We'll see you on the other side. So let me, you wrote these books. What did you do before you decided to write books? Oh, gosh, I've had more lives than a cat. Um, I went to law school. I was in the army. I was a, um, JAG officer. So I was a lawyer for the army and I lived in wow. Korea and Germany, um, uh, Tacoma, Washington. I deployed to Bosnia and then oh I got goodness. out and, um, then I was living in DC. I lived in Ireland for a little bit. Then I was living in Washington, DC and I ended up moving to, to Richmond and, I've pretty much been here ever since over 20 years. So, um, so I was, you know, I did all these different legal jobs and I was just always kind of chafing to do something more creative. And Mm -hmm. finally, when I had my son, my husband was like, enough of this, like, you know, I was going to stay home anyway. So then I started doing a lot of freelance writing and travel writing. And then the travel writing helped around here. There's so much history. So I, I realized, oh, this history actually is interesting. Once I kind of had to force myself to listen. And and I always say, like, with history, I feel like when you don't know anything about it, like the Russian Revolution, if you don't know anything about it and someone tells you something, you're just like, it just kind of falls to the ground. Like, it's like, you know, I always tell kids, like, when you come in from your, uh, you know, playing in the snow, you know, and you've got pegs on the wall, you got a peg for your coat, and you got a peg for your gloves. And But if you don't have any pegs for the wall, it's all going to just fall to the floor. So... Like I always um, say, I, you know, I always, now I try to start with like picture books and Wikipedia and just really general things and get a framework before I start going to the big thick tomes, because those are just discouraging because like, if you don't have a framework to put it in, it's just going to fall to the floor. So um, that's kind of, that's kind of what works for me um, in getting started on a story. I like that. It went from what we did previously to getting started. And I hope that's the moonshine kicking in because I appreciate <laughs> that. I, you know, what's interesting is I actually, I do another podcast called Eerie Travels and we talk about weird crap and oh. um, cryptids and stuff like that. But we just recorded an episode that will have aired by the time this airs, like way aired. But it was on because you're talking about weird things in history and you were talking about being a lawyer. So I just thought of something and it may mean nothing, but it's interesting because it's in West Virginia that this happened, which is the Greenbrier ghost. Oh, my husband is at the Greenbrier right now (laughs) because this is the only case in U.S. history where somebody got convicted because of what a ghost said to her mother. Wow. I don't know if you know about this. So I don't I can say this because it won't ruin the other podcast because different audiences, but apparently, and I didn't, my co-host, Mark Muncy, who co-hosts with me on here sometimes, but um, the, so one of the things that happened, because it was a Mother's Day episode, so she was a mom, but uh, a, a child found her dead out at, at the bottom of her stairs, right? Went and got the dad, 
there he was you know holding his wife so when the medical examiner came to examine her he's like she must have died from a severe faint which is kind of what they considered like a heart attack back then yeah was a severe faint you know whatever and so they buried her whatever her mom one week later wakes up to the daughter being at the end of her bed telling her that um i would i didn't die of a faint i was murdered it was my husband his name is not what i forget what his name is right now um but his name is not what he says he is and he his last name is actually trout and he killed me wow so the mother goes to the prosecutor in town and explains this whole thing but um and of course they're like, well, we can't take the word of a, a ghost. Like you don't take the word of a ghost, but they were willing to re-examine the body. Now, when they had come upon the body, the husband was holding and cradling her head, right? Looking like as if he was broken and blah, blah, blah. Well, it turns out she'd actually been strangled to death. Wow. But because he was holding her. Yeah. It was hidden, right? So it turned out she had been strangled. And then when they did further research into this gentleman, he had killed three previous wives. Wow. So not during the court case, they didn't once bring up um, this person during the court case, the ghost, right? Because whatever. But they said there was a witness and then all this other evidence convicted him. And he was wooing another woman in jail thinking he was going to get out and marry her and but then they her. found he had killed so all accidental deaths one of his wives like had fallen down a set of stairs wow. one of his wives had um i had it they were reinstalling chimney bricks and she died because a brick smashed into her head accidentally like Don't you hate when that happens no, yeah it's so, terrible when that happens happens all the funny time. you told me you were but i thought this is a fascinating story this is worthy of a book because it's the only case in american history where the dude got convicted because the mom saw her daughter's ghost who explained to her the problem and then went to the prosecutor for them to find all the evidence so that's there's so something cool. big fun for you to look into there you go that's awesome i gotta listen to that when you do that podcast wow well don't, don't die on me erica don't die yet <laughs> down the wrong pipe vodka yeah, Come you just need a little moonshine, I think. Yeah. I'm going to need a little moonshine to dull out my vodka. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I actually have that kind of logic. But yeah, it's coming out Mother's Day, which you can listen to it. But I thought it was oh, cool, fascinating little parts of history that you don't know. Anyway, that's, that, that was me that's jumping amazing. around. Val, how do you like that? that that's that pretty good. Awesome. They should use that in a law school class they should they should like like instead sometimes. of the boring cases they do use but i you know what i said as i said i want somebody to bring this up as precedent for another murder conviction i would right. love for this case to be cited uh -huh. as you know it probably never could because it was back in the i think the 1800s but well yeah. it's it it's fair game mm -hmm. in west virginia if it's west virginia state law it's it's fair game it's west virginia state but, law yeah this was like the time I asked my mortician friend if they still teach them about metal and glass coffins and if people still use them. And she goes, oh, yeah, we got to learn and learn about that all the time and, and what bad embalming goes. I said, oh, so they tell you like historical events of where and she says, yeah, they talk about this and this. I said, but they don't talk about this. And she goes, what are you talking about? I said, you know, the, the exploding bishop in St. Augustine. And she's like, what are you talking about? Like that happened. Really? That is my favorite St. Augustine story. My I favorite. love St. Augustine. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I do too. I celebrated my 50th birthday there. And one oh, of my wow. favorite stories ever, ever is the exploding bishop because they put him in a metal and glass coffin in florida to display him after he died and as people you know because they go look at the bodies as they were displaying all of a sudden he exploded in the casket because he effectively boiled oh because keep in mind they didn't embalm back then like that right. wasn't a thing like this dead body they didn't do oh. a lot of preservation i mean they used to display the people who died in the like the barbershop windows and things like that because there were surgeons like you could go past windows and see the people 
who had died or they were out in front of you know the the wow. sheriff's places and the coffins in the wild west like there is some stuff people don't even remember about history that's a little like like in if you listen to um there's a, another good podcast morbid that covers cases and one of them they were covering um they did jack the ripper and the yorkshire slasher who were the yorkshire ripper who came after jack the ripper different guy they found him they convicted him that's a whole thing but um one of the things that was interesting on that case is they'd have the bodies and the bodies would just be left in the street until the mortician came to get them but people would come by to look at the bodies like that it would be spread around town to come look at this body that's laying out in the middle of the like entertainment was very different before television oh yeah 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 Definitely. but we're so, not supposed to be talking about war, these things silver, civil war is the next book yeah I yeah think cool about the civil war that a lot of people don't realize there are photographs of the civil war i know isn't that a, yeah how did that change your your experience with research it's neat to see photographs i mean it you know it i mean there obviously there aren't photographs like we take today but um but yeah it's it's amazing i mean it's um you know, it's funny with the Susanna story, it was, there was very little information about her, but then of course there's a lot about the American revolution. And then with Dolly, there were lots of books about her and, you know, but, you know, probably not as about as much about like war of 1812. And then Elizabeth Van Lew is coming kind of, kind of in between, but it's neat because there are papers of hers. Like I have her um, quote unquote, like diary here. I mean, oh wow! She ended, up, she ended up destroying a lot of stuff um, to kind of save herself, but um, it is neat that there are actually pictures of her. And um, unfortunately, the house she lived in, which was amazing, it filled an entire block. It was actually torn down, but wow. um, but it's kind of neat because I live in Richmond, and yeah. you know, right? You know, there was like a bread riot where all these like poor women, you know, their their families. You know, their husbands and, uh, you know, fathers were off in the war and they're home and and they they had no food. I mean, these people were literally starving to death and they ended up having this riot and they went to the governor and they turned him away and they just started, they pulled out hatchets and pitchforks and they started marching and they said bread or blood and they were marching through the streets and they broke into warehouses. Then they just started breaking into stores and like looting everything and, um oh, wow. And uh, finally, Jefferson Davis came out and he threatened, he said, basically, if you don't leave in five minutes, we're going to shoot. And he had the whole like public guard there. And, um, and you know, they they finally ended up walking away. But I mean, and then it's like, there's a historical marker, like downtown Richmond. And I'm like, I never noticed that. Like, I, how many times did I walk by that or drive by that? And it's just like, wow, that happened right here of, of you know, these poor women that were just absolutely emaciated, like, you know, um, that's just, yeah. Beyond, yeah. I mean, just desperate. beyond desperate. And, um, yeah, so it, it, it's kind of cool that it you know, is like, you know, right here. And, um, but it's it, so war, man, it's so much more complicated than I understood of just, it's, you know, multi-theater, you know, Vicksburg took place at the same time as Gettysburg. I'm like, whoa, yeah. I had yeah. no idea. Like it, you know, there's so many different phases to it. And then even with this, it's trying to set up, you know, why Virginia seceded and what her servants are like, because they're part, end up part of her spy ring. And then there's this, it's called Libby Prison, which is hilarious. You know, my name's Libby. So where the union prisoners are that she starts to, um, you know, she brings them, sneaks in food and messages and uses like pin pricks and books to exchange information with them and, you know, organizes this big jailbreak. Um, but um, yeah, it, it's just like an incredible story, but but even setting that up and all those people, and then I'm trying to set up that she's got this spy ring of, you know, very wealthy people that are bankrolling things, but then she's got blacks, which was very rare you know, in those times and, you know, just this whole like mix of society of messengers and everything else. And, but just trying to set it all up, it's just a spy it's just, network. And it, yeah. And, it, and it's just like, there's so much about the information about the civil war that I find so interesting. And my one, a really good friend of mine from college, 
you know, I live in Virginia, she lives in um, Kansas City, and we, ex she's writing too, so we exchange um, chapters, and then we'll edit each other, so we talk on the phone, and, and she's always like, Libby, this stuff is really interesting, but you're going to have to kill some of your darlings here, because, like, this doesn't really relate to Elizabeth Van Loo, and I'm like, I know, but there's a bread riot, like, you know, <laughs> So, you that's know, and that's what I'm about historical fiction is like, okay, how can I figure out that she just happens to be there when this bread riot happens? And, you know, because it, it's such a, you know, big part of what was going on. So it's, it's, um, it's fun. I mean, I like historical I fiction. I feel that. I feel that so hard, Libby. Like yeah. there's all these cool facts, but we're the story I'm writing. So what I've done, and and this is something Eric and I, we, we own a publishing house for Horseman Publications. And oh, I recommend wow. to a lot of my authors who are research heavy. I'm like, write an article on it. Or yeah. pull together a nonfiction piece or a book of, let's talk about the history that has inspired the writing a little bit. And, and even include those snippets in your newsletter. Because right. readers, yeah. readers who have invested in your story and have fallen in love with the history you've introduced them to want to know more. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's what I realized too, is I just need to write it down and geek out with all the facts. And then if I just put it kind of aside for a month, I look back and it's easy for me to be like, this isn't that important. Like I don't need this, but I realize I just need to kind of like get it down and you know, that makes me feel good. And, but, and then I kind of, I kind of just keep a whole, I'm not like a tech wizard in any way, shape or form. And I kind of, I just kind of keep a lot of notes and then I'll be kind of going all the way through, like, oh, you know, like I just kind of try to work them in when I can. So then when I've like finished the book and I've, I've still got some at the bottom and I'm like, is there a way I can fit them in? And sometimes you just can't. You know, and I've had people say like, why didn't you work up, you know, General Phillips and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I tried. It's like, it, it just, it wasn't part of the storyline, but you know, um, so yeah. So it, it is hard to kind of not include that stuff, but, and that's what I like when I do like historical talks, like for historical society, or I go to retirement homes and then I'll do a talk on like, like I'm going to do, I'm going to start doing talks on Richmond during the civil war to these to retirement homes in Richmond. And like, that'll be great. Cause then I can geek out with all this stuff and, um, and it's fun, you know, and they, they really, you know, when it's, when you live there, especially it, it's fun. So that, so that is it, nice it, about, and that's something you could recommend too, to, you know, your yeah. clients of, of get out there and do a historical talk. And, um, it, you know, it, it's, it's fun. And, and then kind of, once you have your talk ready, you're kind of just dusting it off and giving it again. So um, I have a question. How yep. have you thought about, cause you did these for middle grade, but it seems like, you know, a ridiculous amount about this stuff to take it to <laughs> the next level of writing an adult version of these books. Have you thought about that where you can be more inclusive of facts? Cause middle grade can only be so long. And then, you know, it's right. middle grade. Like you can't have a 400 page middle grade. Book, book, right. Book. It's kind of like a, um, it's kind of like a, like upper middle grade, like almost like YA it's kind of right on the cusp, but, um, but also kind of with my legal training, it's like, you're, you're trained to really pare down your words. And, and I, what legal we, training is that? Cause I've worked with many attorneys and it feels like they, they go based off of the number of words they want to say. Yeah, sometimes, but I don't, but really you're, you know, technically that's what, you know, it's like getting to the point and, and, you know, all that. So I just tend to play a lot with words and really like try to pare things down. So, but the thing is too, is what I love is, and I ended up self-publishing my books. So um, I know so many, I have so many friends who have published contemporary women's novels that are wonderful, but it's, it's hard, you know, you might have a, you know, a book signing or two at the beginning and you put it on Amazon and it kind of is, is out there, but I am very like, I'm happy that I, I can get out and I can do the historical societies, but I, and I love going to schools. Like I love seeing the kids excited and seeing their like Susanna's Midnight Bride projects on the wall and, you know, like little paintings they've done. And, you know, like I, I have posters on the wall that they made for me. And, oh, um, and, and I'm an extrovert. So 
my a lot of my challenge is like right now I'm really in like a month of just writing is I just get lonely and that's what I like having this whole variety where I have all these different outlets where you know I speak and that kind of thing because um I would just go nuts if you know I mean some of these authors that just they don't want to do anything they don't want to interact with people they just want to write and I love to write but I I need to get out and like talk to people. So, um, but yeah, once I do this, I'll have a trilogy. So I haven't decided what I'm going to do next. I'm, you know, so I'm not, you know, I'm just kind of waiting, you know, cause with each, you know, idea that I've gotten, I've been like, Whoa, I have to do this. So I'm kind of just waiting for that to happen. And, um, well, that's so. very cool. I mean, obviously you're going to have to continue doing fun things, you know, like, you know, these stories, but, do you ever think about writing different genres? I have, but um, I I don't know. I really, I really, I love historical fiction and to be contemporary, and I've written some contemporary fiction and, and I love it. I read it all the time, but um, I just find it hard to be like, you're making the whole thing up. Like, it's just like, well, there's this woman and she does this podcast called Drinking with Authors. And then she, you know, it's like, I like need the structure of like, okay, I've got a timeline and then I've got these kind of black holes in between where things are fuzzy and I get to work with that. And, and that like, you know, really like works for me, but, um, but yeah, so I, you know, I just, um, I just if don't know. Um, if you haven't read it, read The Historian by Elizabeth Costava. Yeah, I don't, I know I've seen it. Oh, okay. Okay. So that is a great example that has a lot of historical accuracy about flawed tepes, but there is a just as much fiction and fictionalized journey happening up on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, another one that I am a complete uh, hardcore fan of uh, was James Clavell. And mm -hmm. he wrote the Shogun and the Gaijin and stuff like that. So that's more the Japanese Chinese yep. history. Uh, right there around the same time as the Civil War and and, and uh, back in there. But it felt like a soap opera. Wow. And reading it. And then I'm like, and then it talks about Yokohama burning. And I'm like, what did it? And then I realized, yes, it did. And then the way it started in the story is exactly what they suspect happened. So, but I didn't realize I was, how much was historically accurate until I went back looking for it. Um, so those are some some really great adult themed books. Right, yeah, where there is very heavily packed in historical accuracy, but you wouldn't know it at first read. Um, so those are a lot of fun. Um, as much as I love reading historical fiction, I don't feel like I I like I like I like building worlds at the uh -huh. same. Time. Yeah, and I so, admire you for it. I I I don't I can't do it. In fact, yeah, no, I, I, I don't, I don't build those kind of worlds either. It's way too much to keep track of. Like, that's my whole thing. Like, it's way too much to track. Well, it, it just hurts my brain. Like, I'm just, it's just, uh, yeah, I'm just coming. I mean, it's just, it, it's just so blank, you know, just everything. So um, I have to ask, why did you self-publish? It's not a bad I, thing. I just curious. Oh no, no, no. I ended up um I was looking for an agent forever and it was not happening. And I was, you know, going to home goods and wandering around brooding. And um I ended up talking to a friend of a friend um in Texas and a total stranger, and he just yelled at me and said, get it out there. And I was like, okay. And I within three months I had it out there. It just um, and then it was once again, happy accident. Like now I'm thrilled. I, I love my cover artist and, you know, I was, you know, I was able to hire great. my own, um, you know, I was able to hire my own, um, editors and like, I was able to, you know, I, I gave them the first like 5,000 words and like, will you give me a sample edit? And then I was able to pick who I was the most, you know, comfortable with. And, you know, you have all that control and then it's, been great of I've been able I mean I've got my books in oh probably I don't know 40 50 places you know you know 
Yeah, Mount Vernon. I mean, it's just amazing. You know, St. John's Church. I've got it at the Bush Presidential Library. I've got a bit the um, Andrew Jackson Hermitage, Boston Tea Party ships. And so it's kind of fun of being like, I did this. You know, I this is me. And if something gets screwed up, it's me. And, you know, um, so um, it's like I, now at this. And then it's also once I did it for the first book, it's like, you know, I roll up the second one and I've got all these people like, oh, we can't wait to have you come speak again. And, and, um, and so it, that's another reason not to change genres is you kind of get a following in a certain group. And then, you know, it's, although I do think I could switch to adult and it wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be a big deal. Um, but no, I think and you, that, you'll, you'll find though, that they still want to talk to you because I mean, it's one, if you decide to suddenly write you know, cryptid erotica, you're going to yeah, yeah. do that under another name anyway. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, I like Valdos, but you, <laughs> you will find that even though you write different topics and um, they, they'll still want to talk to you about that because, right. you know, I mean, if you just ditch what you're writing completely, that's one thing, but if you're right. blending it with other things, it just actually increases the expansion especially if you for instance read the kind of books that Val was talking about and go you know what I can do this I can create a character within this framework of this true life story right yeah yeah because um you can do that and then just continue to expand but obviously the methodology you're using to research and stuff makes you yeah. uh, uh yeah. an expert on these things uh, yeah yeah it's um yeah um, because the thing is too, like with the, you know, with the Susanna's Midnight Riders Revolutionary War. So basically all of my school visits are about that because that's what the school studies and the Dolly Madison book, I haven't had one school visit because they don't really study the war of 1812. So I think like the civil war, obviously, I think I'm hoping this Elizabeth Van Lu will be popular, especially in Virginia schools. Cause there's, it's just chock full of Virginia history and, um, and there really aren't as many books, you know, middle, upper middle grade books about the Civil War. But I feel like after that, for that age group, it's like they don't really stu study like World War One. Because I thought about like Elizabeth Bowling Wilson. She's from Virginia and um, she was amazing. I, you know, people call her the America's first female president. Her husband had a stroke and she basically took over. But I, I don't think it would sell that well. I don't think people aren't that interested in... Um, in you know World War World War One, they don't study it in that age group. You know, so it's also looking at things from a marketing standpoint of like what's going to sell and you know what's going to resonate with you know the age group. Um, and, and that's a, a great point. And that's a re like that's where the marketing research comes into play. Right. Like, so far, you've done amazing for self published. I can, I wish, I wish. Yeah, I hope anyone listening to this is taking notes. Take notes from Libby uh, because she hired an editor. She hired the cover designer. You took the time to reach out and, and specialize and get that book in front of places and weren't afraid to ask. The worst that's going to happen is someone's going to say no and it's not going to change anything. Right. But there's a very high chance that yes comes out of those, you know, just simply asking, will you carry my book? And I mean, just and be a great example of this. And, but just being polite and being nice to people, being nice to the person who answers the phone at Poplar Forest. I mean, it's amazing what people will do for you if you are nice to them and, you know, tone of your emails and like people, you know, I have friends that are like, why don't you hire someone? I'm like, first of all, I don't make enough money. But second of all, I want to write the email. And I think that's what helps sell my books is that they're getting me. I'm the author writing to them. I'm, you know, saying, oh my gosh, huzzah, you need more books at Mount Vernon yeah. and, you know, building those relationships with people. And, um, but, you know, like I said, I just feel very lucky because a lot of this I sort of fell into. And I, since it was my first book, I just didn't, I didn't realize like, you know, I, you know, just all these different opportunities that it I would have happen to to your destiny, lady. That's what happened, and it's wonderful that it's taken you this far. But it's a good point on the World War One. Like you would have to write that to an older audience to match the grade group in the educational system when kids are going to be looking for this, right? Um, and that's that's always a thing. Like growing up, when I had to do research on any of these things, 
I had to use the the cyclopedia. I have I have two books back here. They're old. They're old. You know these these wonderful nineteen fifties American heritage books of uh -huh. you know the revolution and oh Civil that's War. awesome. Um, you know with the these old school like vibes, right? Uh -huh. So this is I, love I had to research my papers in but now they have books like yours you know they can plug into the character or the historical figure and experience it sort of firsthand and it's so cool so i have a, one of my dear friends um i met through through my writing um, my friend jenny cody and she writes historical fiction for kids too and so we've teamed up and last summer we did a camp we had 25 campers most of them homeschooled from across the country so it was on zoom and we assigned each of them an important figure from 1776. And they each wrote three chapters in that person's voice. And we edited the heck out of them. And we ended up turning it into a book. So these kids are all published authors now. And that epic lovely. patriot campers. I love that. I yeah. Love that. And my Jenny actually made the cover. Uh, amazing. Yeah. So, so now we're doing the, the camp again. And we're going to do 1777 through 79. And we've got like 75% of the kids from last year are doing it again. And they kind of had the option of keeping their character or choosing a new one. Um, so, um, that's yeah, so, so that, cool. that's been amazing. Because that, that's been fun of like working with her. And and that's what's hard about working alone. I would say it's it's hard to work alone, but it's hard to work with other people. You know, it's it, there's a trade off. So it's great because we'll bounce ideas off each other and and be each other's sounding boards. And that's really that's just made it so much more fun. Oh, totally. Um, me and Val have that same thing all the time mm -hmm. working together. Um <laughs> Sometimes it's brilliant. Another time, brilliant. Sometimes we get ourselves in trouble, and we're like, "I feel like Logan Lucky." I'm like cauliflower, and she's like, "Don't get me into your cauliflower schemes." <laughs> I cannot believe you make a Logan Lucky reference every chance that you get. Every chance she gets, I she does a Logan Lucky movie. reference. The movie is amazing. She oh, I know. Not seen it. It's a Virginia inspired one too. Oh, it's Logan. Logan Lucky. Logan Lucky is a redneck heist movie. It's got Channing Tatum. <laughs> Adam Driver is a one armed bartender. Uh, what is it? Um, it's got Daniel Craig in it. It's got a bunch. Uh -huh. of it's it's so much fun. Oh, that's hilarious! Oh, wow! And Thank as you. she brings it up, any chance she gets. Hello, Drinking With Authors fans. This is your host, Erica Lance. Because of the change of the format of the show, welcome to the literary briefs portion. Enjoy. Okay, so this is literary briefs. This is rapid fire questions. Are you ready? I am ready. Thank you. Wonderful. What is your favorite book of all time? I got to say Gone With The Wind. Um, absolutely loved it as their teenager and read it again and it's just the standard I use for every book I read oh very cool um what is your least favorite book you know I hate to say that because I would hate I, for someone to say that about my books but, but it's um, not it's not the worst book in the world it's your least favorite this is a personal thing we ask every author on the show i this. hate jane austen okay i don't like jane austen and okay. I, yeah i don't i i wish i could i keep starting and like, <laughs> i keep trying dorky, and it's just it's too slow it's and i'm not a big fan of shakespeare like i just i don't like reading yeah. plays i don't i'm it's just my brain doesn't work that way um it just doesn't grab me but um you know, no, teach I'm with own. you. I'm yeah. not a fan of Jane Austen either. And I I I get it and I know why Jennifer is crying, our lead but, editor, right now. <laughs> that's true. We have authors, but the fact is, is it's so like I'm I can't do slow. I cannot do the slow, drawn out, you were crocheting for an entire fucking chapter. Nobody cares. Literally <laughs> I, nobody I cares. I need sword fights, I need guns going off, I need people shouting, I need drama. I need something happening. I cannot watch the willows on the, whatever. It's dumb. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Life's too short. 
Yeah. So if you could have lunch with any author, dead or alive, they'd be alive when you were having lunch. So it wouldn't be zombie weird. Who would it be? Well, um, I would say Jesus because he's the author of the Bible. I would love to sit down with him. Um, trying to think, uh, Margaret Mitchell, you know, from Gone with the Wind, I'd love to talk to her because I know she thought that, um, you know, she thought her book was a hunk of junk and uh, was totally discouraged. And and to even ask her, you know, she never wrote anything else. But um, I think both the, both both those people would be fascinating. And Elizabeth Van Loo, who I'm writing about now. See, I'd love to sit down with lots of different people. That would be a very interesting lunch table if we just put all four of you there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just saying that would be totally tea weird. Afternoon tea will never be the same. <laughs> yeah. So of your two books, obviously they're the, the pe real people they're about, but who would you cast as the leads in them? Oh gosh, that is a excellent question. Um, I know for the Dolly Madison book, I saw a woman, she's a British actress and she she was in that show, Nurse Jackie. And I can't remember her name, but she actually did a PBS documentary as Dolly. And um, I thought she did a wonderful job. Um, so that would be wonderful. Thinking for Susanna, gosh, trying to think of someone who'd be like a 16 year old girl. I'm so like not in the know of uh, who would who would be that. Um, yeah, um, I don't know. Uh, that's something I'd have to think about. I know I have a friend, she would totally know everyone who would be cast. Um, I think it would be fun to play her mother, but I know that I'm not, I'm not, I'm not an actress, but. Um, <laughs> you're, you're ca I like that. You just cast yourself in yourself. your own book. I that's appreciate yeah. that. First to answer that way. This is amazing. Oh, really? <laughs> exactly. You're I would brave. cast you're brave. myself as my that character. <laughs> Which is fair. And then you tell them, and I want my husband to be Henry Pavel, right? Mm, that's right. <laughs> See, she thought about this much better than I did. <laughs> oh, no, trust me. I know who I cast and in and, and what. Though I do feel, I, I don't know, Henry Cavill seems like a pretty fun person. I get nervous because you meet people that you have crushes on, and I, I have had this experience, and then they turn out to be a-holes. Yes. And then like your entire time period that you yes. were crashing on them is just destroyed. Not that you really hopefully yeah. legitimately thought you'd get with them, but there's a whole like thing to having that. Yeah. Crash. I, I met a very famous author, like, oh gosh, it was like probably close to 20 years ago. I cannot read another one of her books. Like she was so rude. I just couldn't believe it. She had written this memoir and I, I was like, oh my gosh, I just... I loved it. It was about like how her best friend died and her difficult relationship. And she just looked at me like, how dare you like eavesdrop on my private diary? And I'm like, you published the book. The book. I, it just like, she just sneered at me and. Oh yeah. See, and with social media, the way it is, don't do stupid shit like that because yeah. people can write about the experience they had with you. Like, just don't. Um, okay. If you could go to any literary world, like world created in a book, where would you go? Oh gosh. Um, well, I think right now I'd go to, uh, uh, civil war Richmond and, um, you know, see what, what it was really like to be there and walk down the street. I don't think you're going to like that at all. I don't, I don't think, think I'd like it, but as long no, as it's very, no, I... um, it would be amazing. I agree. I think you'll be like, nope, next time I'm asked this question, I'm going to Narnia. Like, yes, yes. Happen? Uh, with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. <laughs> or yeah, down the rabbit hole to Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. Well, that place is just as probably dangerous as Civil mm -hmm. War Richmond. So, um, okay. Uh, Val, do you have any questions? If you could be any mythological or magical creature, what would you be? Oh my gosh, these are tough. Um, mythological everywhere here. <laughs> oh, it'd be fun to be uh, Athena, be a oh. Greek, Greek goddess. Why not? Yeah. Yeah, I like it. Yes. <laughs> Wisdom and war. 
And it kind of goes with the theme of your books there, madam. <laughs> that, that, are you sure you're not Athena already? Oh, I don't know. Maybe I'm channeling my inner Athena already. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Very cool. Um, what about, uh, what is a weird food combination that you like? Oh gosh, I love um, kind of Mexican mi mixed with Asian, like kind okay. of the Mexican, you know, f fusion. Um, I love when, yeah, two different cultures are kind of combined. Very cool. What about when you're writing, what's your favorite snack? Oh gosh, lately I've been eating a lot of the seaweed. Um, I love the seaweed, like the saltiness and, and it's just kind of a light snack sometimes where it's like, I feel like eating something, but I know I'm not really hungry. So it's just a um, little snack pack. So, um, and I have, I love like little ginger candies. I love ginger. So as oh, you can tell, too. moonshine selection. So yes, um, <laughs> me too, me ginger too. Candy. Um, what is sort of like your writing routine or ritual? Like, does it have to be completely quiet? Do you have, you know, some people talk about that they have to have their laptop and their feet up in the air. Like everyone has something a little different that they do. What is sort of like your routine that you find yourself doing more often than not? Um, I don't, I, I'm kind of working on trying to get better at routines, but I find I do better when I'm, I'm sitting like right now at my desk in my office and you know, you, It'd be hard for you to see, but I don't know if you can see, but I have like little lights that I turn on and then I turn on a candle and, you know, try to like nest away. And, you know, a lot of times I don't do that for myself, but I'm trying to get better about all those cues that are good for you to get you in the zone. Um, so, um, but yeah, I like it to be quiet. Like I, like even a coffee shop, I would just get so distracted by other people that um, I'm just, and I like to be here and I have all my books I can pull out and like kind of everything's here and the snacks are here. So um, I usually end up writing at home, but sometimes I'll just move around the house just for, you know, something different. And now that it's nice out, sometimes I'll sit out back, sit outside. And um, so that that's nice. Um, but I know that I'm, you know, sometimes I end up at the kitchen table, like after my son goes to school and it's like 1.30 and I'm still in my pajamas and I feel more legit if I've been, even if I'm still in my pajamas, that I was sitting in my office at my desk instead of at the kitchen table. So I'm trying to, you know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but I, I always, I'm like, oh, I, I just thought of this. I'm just going to sit down for a second and write this. And then, you know, all these hours go by. And and um, so, um, but yeah, the rituals are important, I think. To... What is something that you did not expect at all that you found out after you published? like? You did research, you went self up, but after you were published, what is something that came on that you were like, well, that's interesting. Well, it was funny because right after I published the book, I ended up, you know, Susanna's Midnight Ride, you know, was set in, in a town called Hopewell. And I ended up meeting some people there and they were so excited. And they said, well, we have this um, lunch and learn in the summer and, you know, they're with the historical society and we want to add on a week and we want you to speak. And I was like, I'm going to talk to our historical society. Like, what am I going to say? I just, Don't they know this already? Don't they know oh, this? I just okay. was like, oh my gosh. And uh, I was just like totally blown away. And, but how could I say no? I, I, I said, okay, sure. And um, so it was, I just did not, you know, if you had told me, you know, even a few years before that I would, I would talk to members of a historical society about history of it. I, I never would have believed you. So, um, so that's what's been kind of neat is all these experiences where I, I'm like, oh, I can't do that. I can't do, you know, and then it's like, okay, just do it, figure it out. And so it, it's good. It's stretched me in a lot of ways, which has been um, good for me. Well, that's very awesome. I like to hear that. Yes. Um, what about uh, something that you do as an author that is like your Achilles heel? Like, what do you, does your oh. editor go, you have got to stop doing this? Like, oh, with writing? Sighing mm -hmm. all the time. You start all the, the non-important characters with the J name. <laughs> we, we have a long list. <laughs> I know. But, well, a lot of things, uh, well, I tend to write kind of too much. 
you know, exposition and then that isn't really necessary. And then I end up, you know, having to cut a lot of it. Um, um, and, you know, there's the whole thing about, you know, being a plotter or a pantser and I'm kind of more of a pantser and I wish I was more of a plotter, but I just, I admire people that have the 10 page single space outline and they know exactly what's going to happen. But for me, it just takes me, I've got to like get to know the characters. I've got to, because I research before I start writing, but then as I'm actually really writing, I am delving in a lot deeper and it just like, it just takes me a while to make these connections and have all these things. But, um, so, um, but the thing, you know, you've really with outlining it, you've just got to go with how your brain works and, but. Oh, I don't I, outline a single thing. No, she mm -hmm. I write. No, nope. I'm an outline junkie. She is. I am the exact opposite. I maybe put a couple of bullet points down to remember what the next chapter is supposed to be. Like, don't forget you have to kill Sam. And, but that's only for one of my fictions. My other fiction, I'm like, oh, whatever. I'm just going to write it. I know what the ending is going to be. Let's see how we get there. It's going to be a fun journey. Nobody yeah. else has to know. It's a surprise. Yeah, it's a surprise for all of us. But that's why I listen to my audiobooks again right before I, um, uh, do my next right, book is I just listen to them so I remember everything I did say and then I'm like okay good to go I remember what I'm doing next always fun always fun. yeah um Val um you mentioned World War One and and that you And I've noticed that you chose to do American Wars. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason for that? Really, um, a lot of it's like marketing of that I live in Virginia, and then then I can you know go into schools, and you know people are always interested about themselves. So if you have a Virginia topic, they're going to be generally more interested than I'm. You know, do a thing on the history of Wyoming. It's like. I'm not going to, you just aren't going to get the interest. Um, so, and it's neat to live where the history happened and all that. So it's kind of been my, you know, I kind of call it courageous women and courageous American, courageous women in American history. But so it's been kind of neat to focus on, you know, these women are, are from Virginia, but they're national figures or should be national figures. So um, it just, but yeah, it just, kind of um it and it makes the research so much more fun of being able to actually go visit these places and you know um and like the other a couple of weeks ago there was actually a national park service officer was giving a lecture on the bread riot so i went to a lecture on the bread riot so i mean that's just awesome and it's, speaking about going to historical societies i just want to say that i've never heard a term like i went to an exciting thing on the bread riot <laughs> <laughs> like things that I never thought that I needs would to be hear. a t-shirt or a sticker right <laughs> well, they yeah. were chanting bread or blood <laughs> bread uh, or blood <laughs> yep um, I love this but I'm just like um how, how does that work you know <laughs> what was so funny because one of my friends she's such a trooper and I said do you want to go to this and because she she loves history too so she she um, got there earlier than me and she texted me. She's like, you better get in here fast. It's filling up. And then she wrote, just kidding. I was like <laughs> six people there. <laughs> that would be Erica messaging me. I totally feel that. Um, doing so much research, what have you found is your favorite? Well, has, has been the best resource every time like hands down you get a bulk of your info in one go kind of vibe because i tell people there's think outside of just looking at books and articles but going to lectures historical societies and asking the talk with local historians and it sounds like you've done all these things so i wanted to ask someone who is actually out there besides myself which resource have you found has given you the most bang for your buck kind of scenario? Just getting out there and going to these places, like you know, I did the Dolly Madison tour at the at the um, at Montpelier at their home, and I got a lot of um, you know different um, research materials from the the you know the researchers there, and you know, I worked with them, and um, you know, I went 
um, you know, I even ended up in the White House and I saw the, the portrait of George Washington there and, and saw the Octagon House where they moved after, uh, after the White House burned. So in a tour there, you know, in the Capitol saw where there was still smoke on the walls from, um, from when it was burned. So that I love is being able to go to these actual places and, and especially with Susanna's Midnight Ride, I met so many amazing um, interpreters and reenactors. I mean, it's amazing these people that, you know, they spend their weekends and they, you know, at, at different locations. And at first I was so intimidated by them because I felt like I didn't know enough to talk to them. And they were just so happy, happy that someone was interested. And, um, you know, some of them I'm, I'm still friends with. And so th that was just really neat of, you um, of talking to them and then even them recommending a book or recommending talk to this person or, um, um, you know, and then like the book launch, inviting them, to, you know, to come, you know, and um, it's neat when, when you can share it with someone. And uh, that's what I, like my, my, my writing partner now, she hasn't had a book published yet. And I'm like, reach out to these historical societies, reach out to these people because they want, they actually will enjoy being part of your journey. But with your first book, you feel kind of like a fraud and you don't, you know, but it was like, you know, you know, these people will help you and support you and, and, you know, share your joy. And, um, when the, when the book comes out, so that's, what's neat is and also just meeting these people that I never would have met otherwise, you know, at, at these different historical societies and, and in different teachers and all that people, I would never, you know, cross paths with and, or, you know, people I meet at, um, you know, different, like a festival and, um, you know, yeah, Daughters, Daughters of the American yeah. Revolution and, and um, different historical groups. So it's neat of having these friends of all different ages and nobody cares what kind of car you drive or what neighborhood you live in or anything. They're just, they you just know, want they to talk about history the history and, and geek with you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's neat of just this, it's a whole different level and that you have all these interests in common it's it's really um, been so enriching to find a whole different network. Like this one group, it's the best group I've ever joined. It's called the American Friends of Lafayette. And it's people who love Lafayette and um, people from all over the country. Most, most of them are from like the East Coast, but there's get togethers and all that. And they've become some of my best friends. And it's just a blast when we all get together. And, it's cool um, to hear how much your your writing and becoming an author has impacted your personal life, and 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 help you you blossom. Oh, I, thank you. That's a, that's a really uh, sweet way to put it. But yeah, that's what my husband has said. He's like, it's kind of neat that your work is also your hobby, and um and that's what is neat of sometimes being like, you know, with the summer camp. You know, we had. I mean, we had so many laughs and we were like, oh my gosh, I can't believe we're getting paid to do this. I mean, it was just, I mean, we laughed and we, you know, practically cried, but it was for the most part, I mean, it was hilarious. And so it is neat to, um, yeah, to be like, this is all, you know, part of the job. And um, so that is a gift to actually enjoy what you do. Well, and you know, you brought this up, but I think it's important to say, because my um, boyfriend said this the other day, is like, since we started this and we started the publication company, and I have the podcast and I've been really fortunate with the podcast. Valerie is one of my co-hosts. You know, I have several, mainly just because um, time for everybody, but we get to meet so many amazing authors and artists as part of this and mm -hmm. as part of the journey. And I've gotten new renewed friends because you know sometimes as an adult it's hard to make new friends because yeah. um it's different than when you're kids because you don't all have to agree on things when you're kids it's just there's only so much you can do at right least when we were kids you know and he was like I noticed that a lot of your you know friends are writing or in the circles or in the podcast things and I said you know a lot of it's true because I have a lot of lifelong friends that I've had forever and ever which I love but I can't sit down with them and talk about mm -hmm. the publishing thing or the, you know, going to the book conference. It's not that they don't want to listen to it, but it's very right. different than talking to somebody who does that or is a part yeah. of that or is, you know, interested in the things. I think we all find out like one of the things when you publish is your family and friends really want to be supportive. 
but that doesn't mean they necessarily want to read your book or they right. will read yep. your book or they will even buy your book because they'll be like, that's so great. That doesn't mean they're going to go on Amazon and do a review and do all that stuff for you. I would yep. love for that to be the case. Uh, you know, we have people that are definitely staunch supporters of us. And it's great when your um, partner is a staunch supporter and is like, okay, if you're going to go down and talk about killing people in your book tonight, I, you know, I'll be in the other room kind of thing. Like, but yeah. um, it's, it's, you, you need to find that community, that tribe of people that you can become friendly with and you can do this with because it's a whole different way. And I'm sure you had that experience also like from the military. My daughter yeah. was in the military, full support, but I I didn't experience what she experienced being in the right. military, right? She was a combat medic. That is very different. And no matter how supportive I'm going to be of her, she needs people who had that experience to relate mm -hmm. to, to talk about. And we need that as writers. And I think it's important to not forget that as a writer, to find those people. It doesn't have to be 50 people. Right. It is a few people that you can hang out with, that you can talk to, that can relate to when you're saying, you know, I just had this issue and Amazon did blah, blah, blah. Like your best friend in the world is not going to be like, oh. Yeah, like blank stare. I relate yeah. to yeah. what you're saying. Uh, They're just going to go, that Amazon sucks. Did that. Yeah but okay. <laughs> so I, I think it's awesome that you have found that. So I'm seconding what Valerie said there, just with more exposition. Just more exposition. <laughs> ah, do you see how I did that? <laughs> okay. Um, shameless self-promotion time. Libby, how do people find you in your books? Let's see. I have a website, um, LibbyMcNamee.com, L-I-B-B-Y-M-C-N-A-M-E-E. And I can mail you a signed copy and I'd be happy to uh, gift wrap it for someone's birthday and mail it directly to them or Christmas. Um, the books are also on Amazon as well. And um, I'm on Facebook, uh, Libby McNamee author and Instagram as well and LinkedIn. So, um, and I have a newsletter as well, if you'd like to get on my website and, and sign up. So um, those are fun. And I usually have a you know, historical whimsy piece on there um, and uh, usually include our historic recipe too, which is fun. Nice. That is very fun. You, that is awesome. So Libby, it's been so much fun having you on here with uh, us. My pleasure, truly. This has been wonderful. Well, when yeah. your next book comes out, you got to reach out to us so we can I have will. Back. Yep. That would be awesome. Okay. This has been Drinking with Authors, the Literary Briefs edition, and I didn't say it weird that time. Um, I have been your host, Erica Lance. I had to think about it, so I didn't say it weird. Um, uh, don't forget to like, subscribe, leave us comments, reviews. We'd love to hear all of that. You're listening right now, so hit whatever button it is. Really easy. It tells the world how much you like us. My co-host has been the amazing Valerie Willis, who kept her shit together this time, so go team. <laughs> and no, we will no more champagne. <laughs> And we will see you guys next time. Really?